So I spoke with the kids about interruption. And that's when interference comes between you and what you are doing, right? You're having a conversation and your kid interrupts you and it comes in between. And it may be inconvenient, but it's a blip and you continue doing what you're doing. You say, not now! Or, <clears throat> or you give them the evil eye, if you're good at that. And um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about divine disruption, which is a little bit different than interruption. The word disruption is used when that interference comes but brings, but changes things. So I came upon this definition of disrupt that says to interrupt an activity, event, or process by causing a disturbance or a problem. Like... Mark, what, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, Brian's life is now changed because he has sour cream potato chips. And yes, all right. Yeah, sticky and picky, that's a good combo. Anybody have those, any of those chocolate chip cookies there on the back? Reese's. Oh my gosh. Thank you. We have Reese's. There we go. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I'll disrupt you now and change your life. Oh my goodness. All right. We have now experienced disruption. You get a clue as to what it is. And some people's lives are changed because they've got snacks now. And um, what was your reaction when Mark started? What was your reaction? Did you try to ignore it? Did, um, were you embarrassed for him? Like, Mark, obviously this is not the time to sell your wares. Um, nobody hopped up to try and do the right thing in the situation. You're very slow to receive the gift he was offering, um, did you remain unmoved? Obviously, Karen arranged this. She's up to her old tricks. <laughs> Whatever. So it's a good question, though, for us to carry through this sermon today. What is our response when Jesus disrupts what we're doing? We are about to read a passage from John 2, 13 through 22, in which Jesus causes a disruption that was meant to stir up awareness and change things. It also led to his first encounter with the Jewish rulers and shaped the trajectory of his interaction with them for the rest of his life. And we must remember that John tells us about the things Jesus did that revealed that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, who came in power and authority. His authority included the right to disrupt the good people of Jerusalem from their regular tasks and help them to consider what they are doing and why they are doing it. Jesus has that same authority over us and our lives today. Are we paying attention? Do you see the disruptions in your life as annoyances or as an invitation from God to look at what he's doing and try to partner with him? John had Old Testament prophecies about Christ in mind as he wrote his gospel and was seeing how Jesus fulfilled them. And maybe here he had Malachi 3, 1 through 4 in view, which says, look, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. Ooh. Even reading that right now, I got a whole new view. 
So keep Malachi's words in mind as you hear the gospel read. And my brain can't help but hear a bass singing from the Messiah. For he is like a refiner's fire. Anybody else go there? Just me. Okay. It's one of my favorite arias from the Messiah. So this is John 2, 13 through 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables in foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Wait, I have a, a slide for this. Can you? Thank you. Wanted to give you an image. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy, prophecy from the scriptures. Passion from God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. I have another slide. Thank you. More pictures of Jesus cleansing the temple. So Jesus going to Jerusalem for Passover was a regular thing he did. He may have done it every year of his life. We don't know because we don't have those writings. But it's quite possible that he went every year. And all we really see in the other Gospels is his last trip. That he celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem and then did the Last Supper. And that was it. But we don't, we don't know. But in the Gospel of John, he attends Passover three times. So it was a regular thing. And he had probably seen the same scenario in the temple all his life growing up. There they were, selling and trading. But this time he could act. His season of revealing who he was had begun with the miracle at the wedding in Cana. And I wonder if the scene hit him differently this time or years of seeing the abuse in the temple courtyard had bundled up and he was finally able to respond to it. Whatever the case, he disrupted what was going on. Jesus wasn't the only one who had come for the Passover, by the way. It is said that there may have been over 2.4 million Jews in any given year who would come to celebrate the Passover. Like many of us went for the once-in-a-lifetime experience to see a clouded over eclipse. You know, millions went to Syracuse area and saw diddly squat. But anyway, never mind. There's another one in 20-some years. And the Jews um, were scattered all throughout a variety of nations. So for them to come was a big deal. And when they came, they brought their local coinage which was all right to spend in the marketplace outside the temple, but if you were going to do your temple tax, which was required, if you were going to sacrifice, you had to pay a temple tax, it had to be in temple coinage. It had to be a specific, um, a, a specific coin. I couldn't think, denomination, no. What do you call that when you exchange your money? Thank you. A thank you. Oh my gosh. Currency. So anyway, so they had to do that. So when they came, they brought their local coinage, their currency, and they had to exchange it. And you had to pay with the Jewish coins. So ergo, money changers. Now, it would have been okay if the money changers were just exchanging the coins for what was needed. But just like we have today, there was a usage fee, right? Oh, do you get so sick of that? Ugh. 
you can use your credit card to pay this, but we're going to charge you 3% more to use that, even though it'd be much more convenient than you writing this check and we, whatever. Anyway, so therefore, money changing had become a lucrative business for those who are participating in it. And it no longer was a process of filling a need. It was about making a profit. The animals for sale inside the temple walls were also an opportunity for price gouging and extortion. How many of us, be honest, how many of us have smuggled food into a theater because it was cheaper? Come on. Or healthier or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yes, two hands. How many of you used to go to like five below and buy all the snacks there and then go into the theater? Yes, 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 because it was just much better. <laughs> secrets out now <laughs> all right when was the last time you were at a movie theater Ooh, golly for me it's been a very long time anyway um but so the same principles at work here but just like you may um go somewhere and have your bag checked today did they do that at the concert they check your bags Oh, you had to have, okay, so you have to have a small purse. If you go to a show on Broadway, you, they have to check your bag. If you go to a concert at the symphony, they check your bag. So they do a bag search, and they'll catch your candy, your, you know, if you're sneaking it in. But um, so the animals were brought in, and they had to be inspected. And more often than not, you can expect that the inspector would find fault with what you brought in, forcing you to pay more for something you already paid money or brought from home. Cheating was everywhere. Extortion was everywhere. And true worship of God had been diverted. The attention had shifted from a heart of worship to having the right animal, the right coinage, modernized we might say it would be a shift towards having the right clothes, the right car in the parking lot, I don't think we have that issue here, but maybe the right order of worship or maybe whether you celebrate communion every week or not or whether you have stained glass windows or whether you have a picture of Jesus and the Last Supper up there, which I know where you can see that, but um, if you're missing it. But all, all these changes or all these things could be what worship becomes about instead of worshiping God in spirit and truth, and that's what's happened there. And the focus that Jesus encountered in the court of the Gentiles was all about things, not about a heart seeking God. And the things they were doing were disrupting worship for any Gentile who had a desire to worship God. I've got another slide. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I could not find a good one. But um, this area here, this wide area, is the Gentile court. That's where it's a great place for a farmer's market. And that's where they were set up oh, we'll just take this place and do a farmer's market. Strawberries. It was, that's what they were doing. The Gentile court is big. Lots of space. It makes me wonder if that's how many Gentiles came to worship. They could fill that up. It was much larger than where the Jews could go in. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, um, but if things were being bought and sold in there, it would interfere with anyone who was trying to worship God. What if we'd been praying and Mark started his ruckus? You'd been a little bit more irritated, right? You don't care if I get interrupted. But, you know, if you're at prayer being with Jesus and somebody interrupts, it's annoying. It's, we don't like it. It's, it really is annoying. The question we might want to ponder is one we've asked here um, before, but it bears revisiting. William Barclay asked in his commentary, is there anything in our practice as a congregation that keeps people away from being welcomed to encounter God here? That's different from being welcomed in the doors. And I bet for some, offering coffee is a wall. We're going we're gonna to have some barriers, you know. Allowing coffee in the sanctuary is a barrier. Not having communion every week is a barrier. For some, if we had communion every week, it would be a barrier. Do you get what I'm saying? You know, so, but how do we, are there ways that we consciously or subconsciously put a wall up for people 
that, um, that can't be surpassed. And we're also particular about what we like and don't like that can't make everybody happy. But there's a difference between that and putting up a barrier. You guys really are one of the most friendly churches in America. You know, everybody says that, but you guys actually are that. So that's not it. But is there any air of exclusiveness? Do we use Christianese? I, I really appreciate Brian's definition of what discipleship is, definitions of discipleship are, because I think it's putting it in terms we can all understand. Are you getting that? Are you catching on that we want to create this discipleship culture so it's important that we understand what that is and what it looks like? And it's invitational. Is there any tendency in us to make ourselves into a closed club? I think when we did our um, oops, transformation cohort, um, Paul Borden asked us this question. Who do you exist for? Do you exist for the people inside the church or the people outside the church? And we want to be for the outside people. And I, if we had a grade card and how we were doing at that, it would be hard. Gary and I were having this conversation last night that, you know, we, we don't all serve at Taco, but some of you do. We don't all visit at the nursing home, but some of you do. We don't all work at the dandy and greet people with a friendly face, and I hope you didn't steal those snacks off the shelf, Mark. But we don't, we don't all do the same thing, but prayerfully we are blooming where we're planted and we're serving where we are. It might be in your role as a, a school faculty. It might be in your role as a student. Do you serve your teachers? Maggie? which might be your mom as well, so that's hard. But anyway, you know, who, who do we serve and how are we welcoming? I think I got off track. I don't even know where we are. Do we do anything to keep out anyone seeking to connect, connect with God? That's the bottom line. And if there is any attitude in our heart that works toward that end, let us confess it and leave it behind. Let us be on the same page as Jesus that all are welcome to seek and find him alongside us. That's what we want to be about. What were the disciples doing while all of this was being acted out? Where do you imagine them standing? What do you imagine them doing while Jesus is making a cord, a, a whip, and going around slashing at people and tables and kicking them over? Woo! That's exciting. I could have had Mark do that. That would have been fun. I'm going to push over the communion table. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to walk for a week if I did that. But what were the disciples doing while all of this is going on? Where would you have been? How would you have responded? Would you have been a little embarrassed? Lord, Lord, calm down. Calm down, Jesus. It's really, it's okay. It's been going on for forever. Take a breath. Would you have thought Jesus was overreacting? Would you have tried to stay his hand? We know that they were paying attention and that scripture came to mind when all was said and done. The words, passion for God's house will consume me, came from Psalm 69.9. Another building block in their understanding of who Jesus is. Because although the disciples declared again and again, oh, we believe, we believe you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, you are who you say you are, it wasn't a one and done deal just like it isn't for us. How many of you would say you've had several encounters with God over your life that make him more and more real, that give you a better and better understanding? It doesn't happen all at once in kindergarten, Sunday school. It's a lifetime of growth where we recognize, our eyes are open and we go, oh my Lord, this is who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. And if you're really on top of your game, you pray that prayer every day. Lord, show me more of you. I want more of you. So this, that was the first scenario in today's passage. And we're going to move on to the second in verses 18 through 22. I'll refresh your mind by reading it again. But the Jewish leaders, this all happened. Brrr, turmoil, interruption, disruption. The Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. 
All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaim. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. So John records this as Jesus' first confrontation with the Jewish leaders. They understood that only the Messiah would have the right, the sovereignty, the authority to do what he did. But they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah based on his act. They want to see more, so they ask for a miracle. Show us, prove to us. So Jesus tells them that they will, what they will witness, which they misinterpret. He tells them plainly, you know, three days, this, this temple. I bet he even looked at his feet when he said this temple. I bet, yeah. But they were, mm -mm, not believing you, not believing anything you have to say. Ding dong, you're wrong, we're right. And they end up using these words against him at his trial. He said that he would build up this temple after three days. Hmm. How many people turn away from following Jesus because they misinterpret something he said? God promised he'd do whatever I asked him to do. Did he? A common question is, if God is loving, why is there so much pain and evil in the world? That's a question based on a misunderstanding of God's love. Or, why do bad things happen to good people? Is a misunderstanding of what we call good, as Jesus says, no one is good but God. All of our questions that lead to misunderstanding and rejection of Jesus are self-centered based on our perspective rather than God's. Are there things you struggle with that might be a misunderstanding of who God is? Maybe ask God to help you sort that out. If it's hindering you from following him in the way he's calling you to go, deal with it. Deal with it. I trust God for everything, but there's this one thing. So I can't really trust him. I don't want to grow anymore because I haven't felt like he's really going to meet my need. Hmm. Check on that with your own soul. It seems a little early in the game for Jesus to be alluding to his death. I mean, he's just started his ministry. But he has been thinking about that event for all of eternity, right? He knew he was coming. He knew he was going to be the sacrifice for our sins. So in God's sense of time, I'm sure it's right on schedule. It pulls my thoughts back to the conversation Jesus had with his mother about that first miracle where he said, my time has not yet come. That miracle marked a turning point from which there was no return. That was a divine disruption in Jesus' life. He'd been going along 30 years, doing his thing, taking care of his family, loving his mother, loving his neighbors, living out the gospel. But now... He's accountable for every action. Everybody's watching him. Everybody's ready to accuse or ready to believe. It's different. It's a different era. No more flying under the radar. His ministry was public and troublesome to many. Just as divine disruptions in our life may cause discomfort and the need for things to change. The dove sellers and tax collectors and money changers needed a disruption. They had forgotten the whole purpose of what they were there for, that they were offering their services so that God could be rightly honored in worship. But they had taken God out of the equation and put themselves at the center, and that's not where they belonged. Jesus had to remind them. He disrupted them. When COVID came, the question for churches became, is this an interruption that will go away and will return to life as normal? Or is it a, a disruption and will never be the same? What do you think the answer to that was? 
in your own perspective. I think it was a beautiful, divine disruption. And Rome Prez chose to allow the disruption to come and to lead us. I'm so proud and thankful for your leaders during that season. They made hard decisions, sometimes unpopular decisions. I'm so grateful for God calling Ryan. I'm glad he's not here today because it would just go to his head. But calling Ryan to help us with tech before we really had tech going and that him being here enabled us to start having a team. And now we've got Jeremy and Brad and Eliana. I just love it. And it's growing. And it's not, we're not going to ever probably get a big giant LED screen up here where everything's broadcast. That's just not our thing. It's enough. What we've got is enough. And there might be other stuff down the road. I don't know. I don't know what God's doing. But I'm so grateful for Ryan stepping in and taking the lead on that and building a team. I'm so grateful that it helped us to step back and look at what opportunities we had before us. So grateful for a congregation that rolled with it and is open to continually roll as God continues to call us to where he wants us to be. So grateful that we have an online community of faith and we don't know who you are because you don't sign in and say hello, but so grateful that you're with us. So grateful. And those times that you do pop up and say, hey, I appreciate this or whatever. It's, it's like, it's like a bouquet of flowers. So thank you for being with us. Disruption isn't equal to punishment, although sometimes it might feel that way. You might lose that which you loved best, and you do encounter feelings of being punished or grief. And those feelings might just be an invitation to look at why you're holding on so tightly to that thing, relationship, security, instead of Jesus. Jesus wants us to be hanging on to him, and sometimes he has to pry other things out of our hands so that we can be open to receive the better gifts that he has to offer us. We can be so focused on what is right in front of us that we can't even see or hear that Jesus is calling us to something better. If Jesus wanted to get your attention, what would he need to disrupt in your life? What are you holding on so tightly to that it's in the area of danger, of pulling you away from him and sucking you into whatever? What habit might he pull you away from? What routine might he be about to unsettle? Which direction that you're going might he block to get you to turn around and go towards him? Take those kinds of questions to Jesus for a moment. Ask him simply, where do you want to disrupt my life? We'll just have some silence before we go to corporate prayer. Lord, I'm really grateful that you said to me, I've disrupted your life enough for a while, so just hold on. God, I pray that whatever we heard, that we would yield to you. That we would be prepared to let go of the things we hold on too tightly so that we can't receive what you want to give us. Help us to live open-handed. Hmm, both in what we give in our generosity and in what we want to receive and you want to give to us. Open hands as a sign of generosity, both ours and yours. God, I pray for your transformation in us as a people, as a church, as a congregation. I pray, God, that you would direct each individual person 
to the ministry you're calling them to. Show us what you're doing and where you want us to jump in and participate with you. Lord God, I want to lift up to you this morning our friend Ruth Carrington, who's in the hospital with some serious stuff going on. I pray, God, that you would bring healing through the medication they're giving her. I pray, God, that you would bring healing to her spirit and her mind, that you would bring peace to her body and her soul. I pray, God, that you would enable the doctors to treat all the different things going on with her to bring about wholeness and renewed life. Lord God, I'm praying for the youth group that we're starting with the Methodist Church, and I thank you that Maggie and Lauren and Madison um, were there last week along with the other kids from the other churches, and I pray for um, the leadership of that youth group, that you would guide and direct us and give us wisdom about what you want to do and where you want to go. And God, would you deliver me from my preconceived ideas of what it should look like so that I am open to what you want to do. And I pray that for all the leaders, Lord, that we would be open to what you want to do there. I again thank you, God, for our tech team. And I thank you for our band. And I thank you for the things that you are able to do and are doing in our midst. Make us eager to respond to you, Jesus. Get us out of the center of our own lives and we'll put you on the throne every day. For you are worthy and you alone are worthy. And we pray as Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have a word from the prayer team. You can congr congratulate me later. I remembered to do this and greet today. <laughs> <laughs> These are the words we received this week. Open yourself to me. Let go of all that you are clinging to. It is not important. My love sustains you. I won't take it away. It is unconditional. My love never falters. Hold on to me. I have you in my arms. Go. Enter. Move forward without fear, without doubt. I am calling you, so I am with you. Take my hand. Let me lead. You don't need to see the path ahead. You need to trust me with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Fix your eyes on me. Hear my voice. I have the words of life, the words that bring healing and peace and restoration. Do not fear or be distressed. I am with you always. I love you, my child. You have been freed. You are free from the penalty of sin and death. Live life in my ways. I, the Lord, make all things new. Live in joy and purpose. My kingdom is where your heart knows true freedom. Find the life I have for you. Do you know the way? I am the way maker. <laughs> I prepare hearts and move mountains for people to return to me. I am ever before you preparing the way. Sing to me, son, so, I'm sorry, sing to me songs of gladness and thanksgiving. I am making the way for many. Soon you will see swarms of people coming to me for healing and deliverance. They will seek me and they will find me already there waiting. I love you, sons and daughters. I am yours and you are mine for all time. You do not need to fear me. I am your loving father and I desire your heart to be given to me fully.